Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Acts chapter 5. We'll be reading verses 27 through 41. Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 41. And this is beginning midway through a story. And what's happened is that the apostles have created a disturbance with their teaching, and they've been arrested. So beginning in verse 27. When they had brought the apostles, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your, with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged, and they wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council, named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up, and he ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. Then he said to them, Fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Judas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, they joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census, and he got people to follow him. He also perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. Because if this plan or if this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. So they were convinced by him, and when they had called in the apostles, they had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. As they left the council, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. And every day, in the temple and at home, they did not cease to teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the boldness that's seen in this story, for Peter and the other apostles and their willingness to share. We pray that you would give us that same fire and that you would give us the earnest desire to share the Easter story with everyone that we encounter. We ask this in the, in the name of Christ. Amen.
May we pray? Thank you, Father, that you live. Thank you that you live in our hearts. And Lord, we are here to worship you. And we want to worship you with our offerings and our hearts. We pray that you might take these offerings and use them. Use them within this church. Use them outside the walls of this church to bless others. For we pray in your name. Amen.
go to the Lord once more in prayer. God, for the prayers that we have prayed, the songs that we have sung, the offerings that have been given both here and online, we give you thanks, and we pray that these things are to your glory. As we hear your word now, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So we're a week past Easter now. Easter has come and gone. All that anticipation is past. And our minds now naturally turn to what's next? Easter's happened, and now what do we do? The most normal thing to do with exciting news like Easter is to tell someone. If you've got good news, if you've got exciting news, you want to share it. But telling people the story of Easter, even though it's exciting, it can be a little intimidating sometimes, right? And that's always been the case. In the Roman Empire, Christians sometimes found themselves in an uncomfortable precarious position when they were telling the Easter story because the story that they were telling was very new. It was very unfamiliar. People just hadn't heard it before. There was this stuff about eating somebody's body, drinking somebody's blood. There was apparently this guy who had died. He'd come back to life again like some kind of zombie. The whole thing just sounded really suspicious to the people who were hearing this story for the first time. They really didn't know what to make of it. And so because Christians were telling this strange story, people didn't really trust them. People didn't always like them. There was some persecution of these strange people who were talking about eating the bodies and drinking the blood. And that didn't sit well with Christians, obviously. So around the year 150, a Christian named Justin had an idea. He thought, hey, people don't understand us. They don't understand this story that we're telling. So what I need to do is set the record straight. I need to tell people who we are. I need to tell people what we are about. And so what does he do? But he picks up his pen and he knocks out a letter to the man at the top. He writes a letter to the Roman emperor himself. And he starts it like this. He says, To the emperor, I present this address on behalf of all those who are unfairly hated and abused, myself being one of them. And he probably thinks, yeah, that sounds good so far. I've got who I am, got who I'm writing to. Now I need to explain why I'm writing. So he goes on. I have come not to flatter you with this writing, nor please you with my letter, but to beg that you pass judgment and that you will give a decision that will be against you yourself. Because no evil should be done to us unless you can prove that we are wicked people. And even if you do, you can kill us, but you can never hurt us. Now talk about audacious the first person to present this kind of organized, written defense of his faith. He does it by writing a letter straight to the emperor. And he says, hey, emperor, when you look into this, you'll find that you're wrong. You shouldn't be treating us like you're treating us. But you know, even if you don't want to change your behavior, it doesn't hurt us in the long run anyway. It's quite a letter to write. It's a bold thing to say. But maybe even more remarkably, it set off a whole string of other people who wrote similar kinds of letters. The other Christians read this and they thought, that was amazing. I'm going to do that too. And so he starts this whole new genre of literature. And soon Christians all over the empire are writing these explanations, trying to set the record straight and tell people what the Christian faith was really about, what Easter meant. 
And at our best moments, that boldness in sharing the Easter story has been part of the church. That's something that we've had. It goes all the way back to the first chapters of Acts, this passage that we're reading for today. With this story, as I said, we're kind of jumping in midway through. But before this scripture that we've read, the apostles have been helping people, they've been teaching people about Jesus, because Jesus has just been recently raised from the dead. So these are people who are excited. They've got a story that they want to tell. They've got a message to share. And huge crowds are coming to them to listen to them, to hear their teaching. And the Jewish leadership is upset at this attention that they're getting. So they had the apostles arrested, and they put them in prison. But God intervened, miraculously released them from prison, and they went out and just started teaching again. So the apostles were arrested a second time, and they're brought before this council called the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was the kind of ruling council of Israel. It was made up of 71 people. And one of its functions was to hear both civil and criminal trials, which is why the apostles are before this council, before the Sanhedrin. And it's at that point that our scripture for today begins. When the apostles are excited to share this message of Easter that they have, and they meet this opposition from the council. And in this story, I think we see three things, three lessons that we could take from how we can share our faith with others. How can we share this message of Easter and this good news? And the first thing I think we see is that we should be bold in sharing the Easter story. We should be bold in sharing about Easter. When you read this story, one of the first things you're struck by is Peter. Peter is a man who is just so bold in what he shares. They bring, they bring Peter, the apostles, in for questioning. Why are you doing this? And Peter tells them, we have to obey God rather than any human authority. It's really very remarkable. Peter's on trial. He's in a precarious position. He could be worried about his faith, about his fate, worried what's going to happen to him, to his friends. He could tone it down a little and say, I'm really sorry that we didn't listen to you the first time. We won't talk about Jesus anymore. I'm very sorry. But he doesn't do that. He says he has to do what God wants him to do. Have you ever seen anybody do something like that? make that kind of bold step, a moment where someone just put themselves out there and took a risk. I've seen some, I think, in my own life, but, or in the lives of other people. I've personally seen some. But I've also read about some, too. One that really comes to my mind is a moment from the life of Martin Luther, who lived in the 1500s. And as you probably know, he came to feel eventually that the church had lost its way, it had lost its focus, and he started to speak out about what he really thought the gospel meant, what the church needed to hear. And the church leaders were not very happy about that, didn't like to be told that they were wrong, and so they sent one of them to talk to Martin Luther. And this guy told him, this leader of the church, started to question him, told him to think really carefully about what he was teaching tried to make him reconsider his position. Because if the church leadership came down hard on him, it would not be pretty. This church leader told Luther, just think about this. If you keep going with your teaching, if we really crack down on you, all your friends are going to leave you, all your family is going to leave you, everybody that you know is going to abandon you, and it'll just be you. Where will you be then? if that happens. And Luther looked him in the eye and said, if that happens, I'll be right where I am now. I'll be in the hands of God. That kind of boldness is the same thing that we see in the life of Peter here. It's the same spirit that Peter has. And it's the same spirit that we are to have too. 
if we remember that, we are always ultimately in God's hands, then there is nothing to fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. Nothing that would hold us back. Nothing that would give us pause. None of that matters. We're in the hands of God so we can speak with confidence about the good news that we know about the Easter story, the good news of Christ. So if we're to be bold, the second thing that jumps out to me from this passage is that we need to be careful how we share the message of Easter. I think we see that we do better when we share the message of Easter with kindness and compassion. We do better when we share the story of Easter with kindness. We're called to be bold, yes, but boldness isn't the same thing as rudeness. Being bold doesn't have to mean being hostile or belligerent. In the story that we see here, Peter gives a very confrontational speech. You know, he says that the other apostles can't stop in can't stop speaking about Jesus, and then he accuses the council, the people that he's talking to, he accuses them of murder. You guys killed Jesus. You're responsible for this. When you're on trial before the people who hold your life in their hands, you know, it might not be a bad idea to be polite. It wouldn't hurt anything to be polite, certainly, would it? It's a very similar thing that happened to a guy named Socrates, you might have read some of his speeches or something when you were in school. Socrates was a Greek philosopher, and just like Peter, he was put on trial by the leaders of his city for teaching things that the leaders didn't like. So they put him on trial. And at Socrates' trial, just like Peter, he gave a really defiant speech. He said, I'm not wrong. I'm not backing down. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. So by a very narrow margin, the jury voted to convict him, find him guilty. So then there was the sentencing phase of the trial that came next. And there was a new set of arguments for what the sentence should be. The prosecutor argued for the death penalty. We need to put Socrates to death. Well, Socrates argued, not only should you let me go, but I'm such a good guy, and I'm so right, you should give me free food for the rest of my life. And that should be my punishment because that's how right I am and how wrong you are for putting me on trial. So while the jury very narrowly voted to convict him, they voted overwhelmingly to execute him. Because that's what happens when you poke people in the eye like that. It's just not a good idea. And that's sort of what Peter does here. He's in a, a delicate situation, but he doesn't try to reach out to the council he goes on the attack. But what's really interesting is despite Peter's tone, he finds that the council is not really as hostile as they could be. One of their leaders, Gamaliel, he's somewhat sympathetic. He kind of suggests this wait-and-see approach. Let's just see what happens. We tried to stop these guys before. We couldn't do it. So let's just let them go and we'll, we'll see what happens. Maybe God is with them. Maybe God isn't. I think there's some learning in that for us as we think about our tone and the way that we approach the world. Because here Peter does it, he approaches it very head on. He's confrontational. And he finds, again, that the council is not as hostile as they could be. The result is that he doesn't get himself and all the other apostles killed. We can contrast that with what happens earlier in Acts. In Acts chapter 3, Peter is in a very similar situation, and he does things a little differently. There he's talking to a crowd. He gives a little mini-sermon, just like he does here. He talks about Jesus being killed, just like he does here, and raised to life again. But in chapter 3, Peter tells the people that he knows that they acted in ignorance. And he says, I know that the leaders, the people on this council, I know that they acted in ignorance too when they killed Christ. And the result of that in chapter 3 
is that thousands of people who heard the word believed. So maybe Peter's tone here in chapter 5 is the right one. Maybe it was what God put in his heart to do. I don't know if we can say for sure. But I think it's worth wondering, what would have happened if here in chapter 5, he had been a little more conciliatory, like he was in chapter 3? What would have happened if Peter had been a little bit kinder? If he tried to build a few bridges instead of being quite so condemnatory? It's just worth wondering. You know, in the church, we sometimes think in terms of a struggle. We think there's this battle between the church and between the world. We think about fighting for our faith. We tell ourselves that the world is just out to get us. And sometimes that's true. The church is going to have conflict with the world. It is going to happen. Jesus tells us that. But it doesn't always have to be the case. As we see from that story with Peter in chapter 3, it is possible to reach out to people. It's possible to find that common ground when we share the gospel. But if we start with that assumption that we're going to have conflict with the world, that's what we're likely to find. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We might do well to keep in mind that like Gamaliel in this story, the world not, might not quite be as hostile toward us as we're led to think. A little kindness, a little openness to the world can take us a long way as we share the story of Easter with a world that desperately needs to hear it. The final thing we see in this story, I think, is that we are called to spread the gospel in whatever situation we find ourselves, whatever circumstances we face, wherever we are, we're called to spread the good news. At the end of this story, the apostles get beaten. They're told, don't talk about Jesus any longer. And then they're released. But the amazing thing is that the apostles still rejoice They're excited that they're counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of Jesus' name. Wherever they went, in homes, in the temple, they continued to speak about Jesus. This hardship didn't put them off, didn't make them any less excited to tell the story of Easter. I do think we have to be careful here and not make more out of the apostles' suffering than we should. Because there is kind of a line of thinking that looks at passages like this and concludes, if you're not being persecuted, if you're not suffering like this, then you must not be doing it right. You must not be living as you should if people aren't hating you and clubbing you and whatever else. But I don't think the point of this passage is to encourage suffering. The apostles rejoiced in their suffering, it's true, but I think if things had gone the other way, we can suspect the apostles would have rejoiced at that as well. If they had talked to the council, if all 71 members of the council came to faith, I'm sure they still would have rejoiced. The point is not the suffering, and the point is not the success, or the lack of success. But it's exactly what Peter said. The point is obedience to God. It's obeying God and doing what we are called to do. It's rejoicing that when we share, we are right where God is calling us to be in whatever situation we find ourselves. If we share wherever we find ourselves, if we always tell the Easter story, then wherever we are and whatever circumstances we're in, we should be able to rejoice. One of the people who best embodies this, I think, was a man named Eric Little. Eric Little was a great athlete, and you may know him from the film Chariots of Fire. 
He was the runner who was featured in that movie. He won a gold medal at the 1924 Olympics. But what he was really known for among his fellow athletes was for his high spirit, his enthusiasm, and his ability to pour his whole heart into whatever he did. He often spoke about what his faith meant to him, and he shared it freely with other people. When life was going well for him, when he, com when he could compete, when he could win races, he rejoiced in that. He was full of high spirits and excitement. But after his Olympic career ended, Little became a missionary in China. And he stayed in China after World War II began. After the Japanese invaded China, he stayed because he felt like he still had work to do. Eventually, he was imprisoned and placed in a Japanese internment camp. And in those difficult days, when life wasn't going as well, he still continued to share his faith with his fellow prisoners. He busied himself helping the older adults in the camp. He organized games, activities to keep people's spirits up. And he taught regular Bible classes so that he could share his faith with his prisoners, fellow prisoners. But what most impressed those he was imprisoned with was his ability to continue rejoicing as he shared his faith as he taught those classes and did the other things. After the war ended, one of his fellow prisoners described Little this way. Little was overflowing with good humor and love for life and with enthusiasm and charm. It is rare indeed that a person has the good fortune to meet a saint, but he came as close to it as anybody that I have ever known. That's the picture that's being painted for us here in Acts. When life's going well, when we have success, good fortune in our sharing, we rejoice that God has given us that opportunity. But when life isn't going as well, if we face resistance, if we face hardship in our sharing of the Easter story, we still rejoice. We rejoice that we were able to. So we share the story of Easter with boldness, we share it with kindness, but most of all, in whatever situation we find ourselves in, we share the story and we rejoice that we are able to, because it is good news of great joy for all people. Let's pray. God, give us boldness, give us the courage to share. We pray that you would give us wisdom on how we can reach out to others and share our faith in the most effective way possible. And most of all, God, we pray that you would help us to always rejoice. Help us to recognize that the ability to tell others about the resurrection of Christ, it is a gift. As something to be celebrated. Whether it goes well, whether it does not go well, help us to rejoice. We ask these things in the name of the risen Christ.